Hi, thank you for joining me in this presentation. It is the 28th of May and we're still in lockdown. But in this video, I want to tackle the subject of personal faith. I've called this personal faith because I want to make the distinction between personal faith and what we generally believe um, as, as a congregation or as a company of people. Um, oftentimes when we meet up with believers and we want to understand what they believe, their, <clears throat> their answer will be, we believe this, we believe that, we believe in baptism, we believe in the second coming of Jesus, for instance. What they really are talking about is their statement of faith or what is commonly believed by their church or their group. It's not that um, body of belief that I'm really wanting to address, but what do you personally believe? I think that this is extremely important for two reasons. One is, without faith, without personal faith, it is impossible to please God. And the second reason is, the just shall live by faith. So we need personal faith, and we need to make sure that what, what we believe personally is not just a general understanding, but what we actually apply in our lives. Now, let us then just have a closer look at this. If we go to Hebrews chapter 10, it says, Therefore, do not cast away your confidence. That's your confidence. It's a personal thing. Confidence is similar to faith, but do not cast away your confidence which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, it's necessary to endure, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. And that's that's in a very important statement, especially when we consider chapter 11, which follows this. You will no doubt um, see the, the connection. He says, For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draws, anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. The just shall live by faith. And he says, we need to be able to endure. So our faith must enable us to endure because there is great reward. So moving on to chapter 11, we get a wonderful Definition. In fact, it's the only definition of faith that we find in the scriptures. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Of course, we may know that verse very well, but what does it actually mean? How do I apply it to my life personally? And that's what I'd like to explore in this video. All right, now let's look at the things not seen. Let's give some thought to this, the things that are not seen. Just as an example, when you look at an object, like a tree, for example, um, you can see the tree because it's visible and the information that comes from the reflected light into your brain tells you that there is a tree there. So we understand how sight works. Now, the... Um, the definition of faith is we've got to see things that are not seen. Now, if we were to cover this man's eyes so that he can't see the tree, is the tree still there? The answer is, of course, yes, it is. It is there, but he can't see it. How does he know that it's there? Well, the information is on his brain because he has actually just seen it. And then we've covered his eyes. But the information remains in his, in his mind he knows the tree is there, even though he can't see it. So let's just keep that principle in mind. And I'd like to introduce you to two blind men that came to Jesus. Um, and these two blind men, what is very interesting about them and significant, is that although they were blind, they had a perception about Jesus, which seemed to be far greater than the perception that many of the sighted people had. Uh, so let's look at this story in Matthew chapter 9. When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. Now, isn't that interesting? 
that these blind men knew who he really was. They gave him the title Son of David, which is very significant. Now, of course, uh, we've got to understand that Matthew was writing this account and he very, very beautifully and very subtly has woven this into the story because what is the first statement that Matthew writes? In other words, what is the introduction to the gospel that he is writing about Jesus? Let's have a look at it in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, notice this, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So the very introductory words of Matthew is, I want to introduce you to Jesus Christ, who is the son of David, who came from Abraham. Now, what does that tell us? It tells us that Jesus Christ is without doubt the Messiah. He is the promised one. He is the king of Israel. And by expan expansion, he is the king of the world, because that was the promise that of his throne and his dominion, there will be no end. He would rule over the whole world. So this title, Son of David, is what the blind men, although they couldn't see, so seeing what they couldn't see, they believed. So they came to Jesus and they said, they cried out, Son of David, have mercy on us. This is what Jesus, this is how he responded. When he had come into the house, the blind men came to him. So they went into the house following Jesus. And Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. So they not only had given him the title that they believed belonged to him, recognizing who he was, although they couldn't see him. They now, he, Jesus questioned, do you believe that I am the Messiah, that I am able to do this? They said, yes, we do. And of course, Jesus then opened his, their eyes and did the, perform this mighty miracle. And then there was another man who couldn't, um, he was mute and he was demon possessed. And so Jesus cast out the demon. But now I want you to notice the response of the crowd as they viewed this. The multitudes marveled, saying, it was never seen like this in Israel. Now, this same crowd had been with Jesus from chapter 5 of Matthew, which was the Sermon on the Mount. So they'd sat and listened to his whole teaching on what the kingdom of God is like. And at the end of that teaching, they said, this man speaks with such authority, not like the scribes and, and the Pharisees. And they were absolutely astounded at his teaching. And then Jesus went out from the Sermon on the Mount and he healed many, many people. So the, the, Matthew gives us a, a, a tremendous um, overview of the many miracles that Jesus performed. And he actually cites about 10 miracles and, and he gives us the details. And then at the end of it, this was the response of this multitude that had been following him. They said, it was never seen like this in Israel. They were absolutely blown away and astounded by what their eyes had seen. But the teachers of Israel, the Bible teachers of Israel, the people who should have known and should have understood what was going on, the Pharisees, this was their response. The Pharisees said, he casts out demons by the ruler of demons. Now, these Pharisees could not de deny the fact that supernatural things had taken place, that Jesus was doing mighty miracles. They couldn't deny that. So they came up with this um, terrible opinion. They said he casts out demons by the ruler of demons. They were actually blaspheming the Holy Spirit because Jesus was doing these miracles by the power of the Holy Spirit. So here we have these three responses. Blind men who couldn't see saw him in their minds, in their hearts, as the son of David, the Messiah, the promised one. The crowds who saw all the miracles and they could experience and witness everything that Jesus was doing. They marveled at what he was doing and they were blown away and amazed, but did nothing about it. The Pharisees, on the other hand, blasphemed him. Three responses. So here's the question. What is your personal faith? What is your opinion of Jesus, even though you haven't seen him? Okay, so let's now move on to something that we have spoken of in previous uh, videos. The fact that there is an invisible realm around us and we're living in the visible realm. 
Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that the things that are invisible are eternal and the things that are visible are the temporal things. So they have got an expiry date. They are subjected to time. The things that are invisible to us are the eternal things. Now the question is, we can't see, obviously, these invisible things, but do they really exist? Remember the example that we used with the man looking at the tree. When his eyes were blocked so that he couldn't see, was the tree still there? The answer is yes, it was. It's just that he couldn't see it. So the question that we've got to settle in our own hearts is, the invisible things around about us, God, the throne of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the angels, the eternal things. The Bible says that the, the angels of God encamp around about those that fear him. So that's what we're told. Do they encamp around about us? We can't see them. Is that a fact or isn't it? So these are the things that we have got to work through in our hearts and in our minds. We can't visibly see these things, but do they exist? Is it true or isn't it? That's absolutely vital for us to personally come to this conclusion. Not just say, I'm part of a group. We generally believe that Jesus is the Son of God. We generally believe Jesus is coming again, um, etc., etc. This is our statement of faith. That's not good enough. We need a personal, deep conviction about these things so that we can, like those blind men, identify correctly the Lord Jesus, even though we can't see him, and then go to him and say, Lord, we believe. We, we absolutely um, are convinced that you are the son of David. Let's now get back to our definition. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. So things hoped for is speaking of future expectations, but our faith is substantial. It is a substantial quality of the things that we hope for. Now, if, for instance, we, um, we were hoping for something, let's say we were just hoping that um, our ship would come in and we would win the lottery. What are the chances of that happening? So what is the, what is the substance that you base that hope upon? It is so flimsy that it's virtually impossible. So that's a hope that will, you will not realize because the substance or the basis of um, your hope is very, very flimsy. So now, what are we hoping for? We're hoping for the resurrection. We're hoping for eternal life. We're hoping to be part of the new creation because that's what the scripture promises us. So what is the substance of our hope? What is the, the basis? How reliable is the basis of our hope? And that's really what this uh, definition is dealing with. Let's just dig into this a little more by looking at the examples that follow in this wonderful chapter 11, where uh, many, many examples are given to us by the writer of Hebrews of people who applied this very definition in their lives. Let's have a look at Sarah first of all. By faith, Sarah, now you remember, she was 90 years of age and she had never had a child. She was barren. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, to have a child. And she bore a child when she was past the age, 90 years of age, because and here is the substance of her hope. So she was hoping for a child. And here's the substance. She judged him faithful who had promised. That's what substantiated her hope. When she looked at the circumstances of her life, 90 years old, she was so old, and her husband was 100, almost 100 years old. So the, the possibility of what her eyes could see and the circumstances that surrounded the possibility of her expectations being realized were no. They were really no. But she didn't base her hope on the circumstances around about her, what she could see. But she based her hope on the fact that she judged God faithful who had promised. And that gave her faith 
substance and made her hope or her expectation absolutely guaranteed. It was guaranteed on the basis of not the circumstances, but the one who had promised. So that was the substance of her, of her hope. <clears throat> now let's look at another example. We'll look at her husband, Abraham. And you'll know this, this account where Abraham was put to the absolute extreme test of taking his son and sacrificing him. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, so this was the promise, in Isaac your seed shall be called. But this is how Abraham dealt with this very, very challenging situation. He concluded, in another version it says, he reasoned. So in his mind, he went through the process. He didn't just blindly take his son and go out there to sacrifice him. He said, now hang on a minute, <clears throat> God has told me to sacrifice my son. Let me think about this. So he reasoned and concluded that God was able to raise him even from the dead. So he thought, I'm going to go out, I'm going to obey God and sacrifice my son because I know that he's promised and I believe that if I kill him, God will raise him from the dead. So whatever happens, I'm not sure how this is going to work out. He didn't know exactly what the future held, but this was his confidence. This was the substance of his confidence and his faith. Uh, and he acted upon it. He took his son out onto that mountain to sacrifice him. And he absolutely believed the hope that, that was set before him. He believed that that hope was he would come back with his son. He and his son would return. So <clears throat> that's the basis. He, he had a very firm and solid substance to his hope. And that's what um, is being the example is explaining to us to understand that definition of faith. Let's now examine the second part of that definition where it says, and faith is the evidence of things not seen. So the invisible things, we need evidence. Let's look at this example. By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen. So he had never seen the judgment that God envisaged and that God had said was going to come, the flood upon the earth, because it had never rained. So it seemed like an impossible situation. It was something that couldn't be seen. But being divinely warned of things that not seen, he moved with godly fear. This is, he acted by faith, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. So his faith had substance and he based the fact that God had promised and God had warned that there was a judgment coming. And based upon the reliability of that information, his faith was substantiated by that information and it moved him so much that for a hundred years he built an ark even though everybody around him disagreed and disapproved uh, of what he was doing. He nevertheless did it. And there was no apparent evidence of the flood coming, but he absolutely believed that it was coming. And so seeing things that are not seen, he was moved with fear and he built the ark. Then there is another example, Moses. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than, than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. So Moses saw that there was a future hope, a reward that he was looking for. By faith, he forsook Egypt with all its pleasures and all its treasures and all the potential that he could have become a pharaoh in Egypt and lived in a in a palace. He rather went and identified himself with the slaves, the Israelite slaves. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured, and this is what got him through, 
as seeing him who is invisible. So his faith enabled him to act in a way as though he could see the invisible God. And that's what our faith, our personal faith needs to do for us. We need to act as though we can see him who is invisible. Now, uh, it's not a case of, of acting. Our faith is the substance of that expectation. And then it is also the evidence of things not seen. So now, what about the evidence? Another version of that verse says, the proof of things not seen. So where do we get the evidence? And this is, this is what I believe it is. <clears throat> As we apply our faith, remember what it says in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. For it is impossible, without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So as we apply our faith, we come to the invisible God. We spend time in his presence. We exalt him. We, we gather the information of his word. So in other words, the Holy Spirit takes the word of God and reveals these truths to us, writes them upon our hearts so that they become clear convictions, they become substantial uh, truths within our heart that cause us to absolutely believe in the expectation, the hope of the resurrection. And as we apply these things in our heart, by the revelation of, of the Holy Spirit, what happens is God then gives us evidence of the things that cannot be seen. Now, what do we mean by that? <clears throat> Let me just give you an example. If a blind man was sitting and he's hungry and he's, he's really wanting something to eat and then someone comes to him and says, look, if you just wait here for about an hour, I'm going to go through to the kitchen and I'm going to prepare you a lovely meal. So the man sits there. He can't see anything. He can't hear anything. He can't smell anything. So he's sitting waiting for his meal. He believes that it's going to come because the substance of his hope is the fact that he believes the reliable source, the person who promised that they were going to make the meal, he believes that. So he's holding fast to that promise. And so the hope of receiving the meal is now a substantial hope. He believes it's going to come. But then the person preparing the meal decides to give him a little taste. So they cut off a little piece of meat that they've cooked, bring it to the blind man. He tastes it. And he now knows that not only is the meal promised, but he's now had a taste of it. It's becoming so real. That's exactly what the Holy Spirit does for us. The scripture tells us in Hebrews that he gives us a taste of the powers of the world to come. Hebrews chapter 6 tells us that. We, we receive a taste of the powers of the world to come. So the Holy Spirit takes the unseen things and from time to time we, we just experience just a little taste, just a little, uh, we see through a glass darkly, we don't see clearly, but it's just a little bit of evidence that the Lord gives to us to spur us on in our faith. And that, that is absolutely wonderful. So getting back to our definition, we need to personally explore and examine the scriptures. It is wonderful when we receive teaching, a Bible study, even like this, um, we receive information. But until we go and personally examine that information and say, Lord, I want to understand clearly and believe your word. I want it to be written upon my heart and upon my mind by your spirit so that it becomes a personal conviction. It's only then that your faith becomes substance a substantial foundation upon which you can now expect what God is promising. God is promising resurrection. He is promising eternal life. He's promising that we will have a part in the new heavens and the new earth. And that, that's something absolutely glorious and wonderful. But our faith is what um, causes us to see these things that cannot be seen. And then those little evidences, those little tastes, of the wonderful eternal life 
the taste of the power of the world to come um, just spurs us on. And as, as this faith, this personal faith, takes effect in our lives, remember what it says in Hebrews chapter 10, the just shall live by faith. So it's important now that we recognize that our faith is not just a mental perception. It is not just a conviction. It's got to become an action. Faith is an action. Faith has got to motivate us. It is a motivating force within us to act. Um, James puts it very bluntly. He says, show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. So in other words, our faith has got to be revealed by what we do. It has got to become a motivator to cause us to go into action and to serve the Lord as those that can see things that cannot be seen. As it says here, this is Abram's testimony. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. So we may not be able to understand the detail of the hope. How are, are we going to be resurrected? When exactly will this happen? When is Jesus coming? What will the new earth be like? It's all those facts that we don't know. But what we, we are persuaded are, uh, of is that they will definitely take place. So like Abraham, we, we can do the same. God has revealed his word to us personally. So by our personal faith, we now believe in the promises that he has made because his promises are sure. So we press towards the mark. We haven't yet attained, but we're pressing towards the mark. If by any means we might attain unto the resurrection, holding fast, not casting away our confidence, which has great reward, but we have need to endure so that after we have endured trials and difficulties and temptations that this life brings to us, we will then receive what God has promised. We will receive the promises. All right, so to conclude this, I'm going to read a portion out of this very inspiring chapter, chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews, reading from verse 32. Just listen to these words and allow them to sink into your heart. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, and of Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of the fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned the flight of the armies of the aliens, Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Then the first words of the very next chapter are extremely challenging. Therefore, we also. We need to follow their example. May God bless you. Amen.